This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Lermin Sheikh. South Africa has urged the International Court of Justice to take action if Israel goes ahead with its planned ground invasion of Rafah. In a statement, the South African government said it's concerned Israel's actions in Rafah will result in, quote, further large-scale killing, harm and destruction, and breach the Genocide Convention. This is South Africa's international relations minister, Naledi Bandor, speaking Wednesday outside the African Union headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. South Africa is totally horrified at what is happening, continuing to happen to the people of Gaza and the West Bank and now Rafa. Uh, we believe this confirms the uh, allegation we've tabled uh, before the ICJ that uh, genocide is underway in the Palestinian territories, in the occupied uh, territories, and clearly the actions of the Israeli government prove that what we have said is actually accurate. For more, we're joined in Geneva, Switzerland, by Ken Roth, visiting professor at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs, served for nearly three decades as the executive director of Human Rights Watch. Ken, welcome back to Democracy Now! We just heard this devastating report on the ground from a journalist in Rafa, in Gaza. Um, and then we hear the South African foreign affairs minister talking about the renewed appeal they're making to the International Court of Justice. Can you explain what's happening and what this imminent ground invasion, if that's what's about to happen in Rafa, means, and if you think international law can deal with this? Well, Amy, I think, as everybody knows, the Israeli military has gradually been moving from northern to southern Gaza. And the last place left, the supposed safe place, where at this point, as we've heard, 1.2 million Palestinians have congregated is Rafa. There's no place else to go within Gaza. And, you know, not surprisingly, there undoubtedly are some Hamas people there, too. And so Netanyahu is saying, we want to invade Rafa. Now, there's this problem. There would be massive bloodshed if that happened. So even the Biden administration is saying, don't do it until you evacuate the civilian population. Now, Netanyahu has said, yes, I'll, I'll evacuate, but there have been no plans whatsoever. And indeed, if you listen to the far-right ministers in his cabinet, people like Ben Giver and Smotrich, you know, people whose votes Netanyahu depends on to stay in power and to stay out of prison on corruption charges, they're saying the only evacuation that they want is into Egypt, out of Gaza, a forced deportation, probably another Nakba with little prospect that anybody who leaves Gaza would get to come back. And so that's the stake. Um, everybody's telling Netanyahu, move people someplace else within Gaza, but there's no place else that's safe. Netanyahu's determined to move forward because he needs to keep this war going. Once the war ends, his political reckoning for the intelligence failure of October 7th starts, and he's likely to be out of a job. Um, and, and we're sort of in this dilemma. Now, the International Court of Justice could intervene. Um, the order that it issued last month had basically three elements to it. Um, one was, you know, take far greater care not to kill civilians. Two was to allow in humanitarian aid. And three was for Israeli government officials to stop their incitement of genocide. And as far as we can tell, it was only the statements that have stopped. The aid has not come in in any greater amount. The killing doesn't seem to have stopped. And so, in any event, Israel has to report back to the International Court of Justice on February 23rd, I have no idea what they're going to say, because they basically have just, like, ignored the order. Um, but now there is a possibility that even before the 23rd, the court will hear this emergency application from South Africa. And I think it's worth noting that in the original case, South Africa, you know, sought a ceasefire. But I never thought that was in the cards, because only the Israeli government, only states, frankly, are before the International Court of Justice. Hamas wasn't there, so the court wasn't going to order a ceasefire of just one side. But Rafa is different, because uh, there's not a lot of fighting by Hamas from Rafa, but rather this is just a, a proposed invasion by Israeli forces. And it is conceivable that the International Court of Justice would order a halt to that. That, of course, begs the question, who enforces that? Um, the UN Security Council has that power, but that requires contending with the U.S. veto, contending with Biden. 
The person who frankly does have the most power to stop all of this bloodshed is Joe Biden. But so far, while he's been outspoken, he's not been willing to put any teeth in his words. Most significantly, he's not been willing to stop or even to condition the $3.8 billion in annual U.S. military aid or the massive arms sales to Israel. Those are the kinds of steps that, if taken, Netanyahu would be forced to listen to. But so far, Biden's words are just empty, and Netanyahu ignores them. Ken, Ken Roth, if you could say a little bit more about uh, this enforcement or lack of enforcement mechanism of the International Court of Justice. You wrote a piece uh, last month in The Guardian suggesting that the political pressure, despite the lack of uh, enforcement mechanism, that the political pressure on Israel would be such that they would have to, in some sense, comply. So a, a couple of questions. First, what would happen, for instance, February 23rd, as you said, Israel is supposed to report back. Is it possible that they do not report back? And then the International Criminal Court, which takes, of course, individuals uh, to court. Who are the people? You've just mentioned senior Israeli officials, Ben Gavir and Smotrich. Who are the people that the ICC could prosecute? And your uh, response to what Karim Khan uh, so far has said. Well, in terms of, you know, what is the pressure on Israel? I think it can be broken down into three elements. You know, one is just the, you know, the utter embarrassment of having been found to be plausibly committing genocide. That's what the court found. Now, most governments, that would be sufficient to, you know, force them to step back. But this is Netanyahu. And, and you know, as I mentioned, um, Netanyahu's political future and, frankly, his personal liberty are at stake. And Netanyahu has always prioritized himself. And so ending the war means, you know, this political reckoning, this investigation into what happened, what intelligence failure allowed October 7th to take place. Uh, he doesn't want that to go forward, so he keeps fighting and fighting, hoping somehow to survive, somehow to stay out of prison. So the, the shaming isn't working. The, the, the economic pressure that Joe Biden could exert on Israel would be very powerful. You know, to stop the billions of U.S. military aid, to stop the arms sales, that would be incredibly powerful as a statement. Joe Biden is nowhere near that. He's, you know, speaking nice words. He's saying, take greater care for civilians, let in more humanitarian aid, don't invade Rafah without an evacuation plan. But there's nothing backing that up. And, and Netanyahu basically is just, you know, thumbing his nose at Joe Biden because there's no clout behind these nice words. Now, the final you know, source of pressure, which you mentioned, is the International Criminal Court. And, and for viewers, just to make clear, there are two tribunals in The Hague, just to confuse people. You know, one is the International Court of Justice, which is a civil tribunal that hears complaints between states. That's where South Africa brought its genocide case. That's the court that made the ruling that Israel is plausibly committing genocide and issued the, the three basic orders that I outlined. The separate tribunal is the International Criminal Court. This is, as the name implies, is a criminal court. It prosecutes individuals, not governments. It tends to focus on the most senior responsible officials. And that means it's gonna look at the chain of command. And it's quite clear that in this case, the, the orders with respect to you know, dropping these 2,000 pound bombs that are causing such devastation in Gaza, the orders to allow in only drips and drabs of humanitarian or medical aid. You know, these are orders that are coming from the top. So I think the people who are most vulnerable would be Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, and Yoav Gallant, the defense minister. Now, is Karim Khan, the chief prosecutor, going to act? We don't know. You know, he has had an open investigation into what's called the Palestine case since he took office in January 2021. But he has gone very, very slowly. And so far, all we've gotten from him is a couple of nice, eloquent statements before the media. One on the Egyptian side of the Rafah border, another from Ramallah, the, the capital of the Palestinian Authority um, in the West Bank. And so, the, you know, he's a barrister, he's very eloquent, these are nice statements, but nothing else. So we're all waiting for the war crimes charges. Clearly, Hamas is going to be charged. You know, what it did on October 7th is horrendous. You know, killing civilians, abducting civilians, blatant war crimes. So, you know, Hamas leadership is very vulnerable. 
I don't see Karim Khan only charging Hamas, given 28,000 Palestinian deaths in Gaza, given the pervasive starvation in Gaza. So he's going to have to look at both sides, and he's not moving quickly. If he were to move quickly, um, that would wake people up. You know, if Netanyahu suddenly faced war crimes charges, um, that would be a very different factor in the calculation that leads him to keep killing and besieging Palestinian civilians in Gaza. In terms of crimes against humanity, the cutting of aid to UNRWA, the U.S., the largest contributor to the U.N. Palestine Relief Agency. Can you talk about the significance of this and the Senate bill that was passed by Democrats and Republicans, not only giving $14 billion, much of it in military aid to Israel, but cutting aid to UNRWA that runs the hospitals, the schools, to millions of uh, Palestinians in Gaza and in other places as well, Ken, and Israel particularly targeting hospitals. Well, Amy, as you note, the, the treatment of UNRWA has been absolutely despicable. Um, the Israeli government claims—they haven't put forth evidence, but they claim that 12 UNRWA employees out of 12,000 in Gaza, that 12 took part in Hamas's October 7th attack. We don't know whether that was true or not, but UNRWA did everything that Israel conceivably could have imagined. It fired the staff members who were still on, on, on the staff. A couple of them had apparently died already. Um, it immediately launched an investigation. It did everything you would want. But Israel's attack on UNRWA is really not about those 12 staff members. Israel has wanted to get rid of UNRWA forever. Now, this was, I think, um, accentuated by the fact that the International Court of Justice actually relied repeatedly on descriptions by UNRWA of the awful reality in Gaza, the utter lack of humanitarian aid, the starvation, um, the, the attacks on, on hospitals and the like. Um, but Israel hates UNRWA because it believes that UNRWA is responsible for the Palestinian refugee problem. This is utterly naive. UNRWA is a humanitarian agency. It does, you know, as you noted, run schools and clinics, not only in Gaza and the West Bank and East Jerusalem, but also in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, you know, wherever Palestinian refugees are. And the Israeli government view is if UNRWA were to disappear tomorrow, Palestinian refugees would somehow forget that they're Palestinian refugees. And this desire to return to their ancestral homes in Israel would just evaporate. Now, you know, this is a way of just whitewashing history. You know, suddenly we don't have to talk about 1948. We don't have to talk about um, the, the, the fact that there were, you know, 600,000 Palestinians who were forcibly displaced by Israeli forces and have never been permitted back to Israel. That just disappears. You know, that was the original sin, but we're going to forget about that. We're just going to get rid of UNRWA. Now, this is naive, but that is the Israeli government line. And what's particularly despicable is that Joe Biden fell for this and suspended aid to UNRWA, followed then by 18, 19 other governments around the world. And, you know, it would be one thing to believe this kind of propaganda, you know, in ordinary times. But this is in the middle of a war. This is in the middle of a situation where there is, by all accounts, widespread starvation in Gaza. There is impending famine for a significant part of the population. And UNRWA is the main vehicle to deliver what drips and drabs of aid get into Gaza. You know, now, some of the governments, like Germany, said, oh, well, other groups can deliver the aid. But the other groups got together and issued a collective statement and said, there is no way we could even come close to replicating UNRWA staff. UNRWA alone has this capacity to deliver aid in the midst of this war. So if you devastate UNRWA, which is what this funding suspension does, UNRWA has said, you know, it will have to shut down by bid barge if the funds are not renewed, to get rid of UNRWA is to condemn the Palestinian population in Gaza to death by starvation. And that, we should be clear, that's what's going on right now, because Israel has this ideological vendetta against UNRWA in its hope that it can somehow disappear the Palestinian refugee problem.